Uh, hello everyone, Brian Kibler here, and uh, I am in my hotel room uh, in Brussels, Belgium, uh, for Pro Tour Dragons of Tarkir. Uh, it is Monday for the Pro Tour. I've actually been here, uh, what, I lose track of time, <laughs> uh, four days, been here since Thursday, how many days that is. Um, and I've been, you know, pretty busy the whole time I've been here, uh, sort of cramming and testing for, uh, for the standard and draft portions of the Pro Tour. Um, you know, the Dragons of Tarkir set, uh, you know, had huge impact on both standard and on limited. Uh, obviously with the huge rotation in limited with cons no longer in the format, it's, you know, a big shakeup. Uh, and then there's lots of really cool, really powerful cards that are now legal in standard that weren't before. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I came into testing um, kind of wanting to play a, shockingly, a, you know, like a green-red dragon deck. Um, I thought that the dragon synergy cards uh, like dragon, Draconic Roar and uh, Thunderbolt Regent uh, seemed really powerful, and uh, my suspicions about those cards were, were borne out in the results of the Star City Games Opens and the Invitational uh, that you know, have been the, the only real major tournaments where Dragons of Akira has been legal. Uh, and in fact, green-red sort of dragon aggro was perhaps the most popular deck at the most recent uh, Standard Open, which was ultimately won by Chris Van Meter playing a more sort of big green-red deck. And uh, as much as I love big green and red creatures and dragons in particular, I don't really like being the person who is, you know, sort of playing the deck that is square in everyone's sights. I think that green-red aggro is probably going to be the deck that people spend the most time preparing against. I think that, that and Abzan Aggro are likely to be sort of the two front runners in most people's test gauntlets, uh, along with, you know, Abzan Control. I think those are probably going to be the most popular and most prepared for decks in the event. Uh, and, you know, I don't really want to be playing, you know, the same deck as everyone else. Um, not necessarily just because I, you know, want to be different or anything, um, but I do think there's some value in being, uh, in playing something as long as it's strong that's off people's radar. Um, the version of Green Red that I was working on was actually a bit different from that which was played by most of the players uh, in those events. Um, a lot of the players, you know, other than CVM, who played a more sort of ramp style of Green Red deck, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, I think that going up to Atarka and ignoring the sort of low end, because I think the low end of the deck is, is bad uh, for the most part, the way people have built it. Um, I've actually felt that Goblin Rabble Master was absolute trash in Green Red for a long time. Um, I played it in uh, Grand Prix Denver when I played Green Red there, um, and literally, I think I won one game pretty much based on, like, you know, a, a explosive Rabble Master draw. Um, Rabble Master is a sort of card that pairs really well with spells and not with creatures. Uh, it's really good in a deck like Jeskai, where you have, like, a bunch of spells to support it. You have Jeskai Charm to get rid of, get big creatures out of the way, or synergize with the multiple tokens. You know, you have lots of just cheap ways to get it through, um, and that doesn't exist in Green Red, at least in the way people are building it. So, you know, it doesn't work very well with Crater's Claws. It doesn't work very well with, you know, it works okay with Draconic Roar. Um, but just, you know, you, you don't have that many tools that are really synergizing with this card. And it's so bad when you're behind. And I just think the card is just, is just not very good in that shell. Um, so I had been working on Green Red with uh, Death Mist Raptor. I think that Death Mist Raptor is one of the most powerful cards in the new set. Um, and I actually originally sort of had a, a sketch of Green Red with Death Mist, Ra Death Mist Raptor. Um, and Den Protector that I posted in uh, our team forum on Facebook that I was like, hey, this is kind of what I want to check out. You know, I think that Den Protector is really powerful. Uh, I think that, that, you know, the synergy with this and uh, and Raptor is really good. You also have, naturally, you have Rattleclaw Mystic and you have Phoenix that also have Morph. So, you know, there's a bunch of things that sort of add to this sort of synergy you have going on. Um, and even, even without it, they're both just independently powerful cards. You know, Raptor is, you know, a 3-3 three, three Death Touch for 3, which is... Not amazing, but, you know, strong. Uh, and then Den Protector is, you know, a, like, Eternal Witness type effect um, with an added ability, uh, with, you know, that can't be blocked by creatures with power less than it, which it turns out is actually quite relevant in a lot of situations. So I was working on this deck, and I, I went away with, you know, went to Iron Shaman for a while because it's a cheaper morph cost, but it wasn't really nearly as powerful as Den Protector um, actually getting the card guaranteed back. You could get, you know, more sort of uh, tricky raptor blots with just one mana open with Irish Shaman. Um, but Den Protectors turned out to be what was really, you know, the really powerful thing going on there in a lot of cases. Um, so the deck that I was working on, the green-red deck, was, you know, sort of the dragon build. Um, but it had more, it had like like Roar and 
a wild slash because Den Protector works best, kind of like Snapcaster Mage, and that it works best with cheap interactive cards, cheap things that you can proactively play or maybe react, sort of reactively play. You know, basically cheap things you can you you're going to find uses for in the early turns of a game that you can then rebuy and play again thanks to Den Protector. Um, but I found that you know with like Dragon's Roars and Wild Slashes in my deck, um, they were kind of situational and low impact against a lot of strategies. You know, there are a lot of decks where, where you know, three damage to a creature, two damage to a creature, or player are just not powerful effects. You know, against Abzan, against any kind control deck, against, you know, bigger dragons, they just don't do that much. Um, so I kind of got to uh, working on various other sorts of Den Protector ma- Raptor shells. You know, I felt like Elvish Mystic, Den Protector, and Death Mist Raptor are a super powerful sort of shell of a deck. Um, and I was like trying to explore all the different opportunities. And literally last night, I like, couldn't sleep. Um, I, you know, whether it was jet lag or whether it was just too much going on in my head, to, you know, sort of figuring all this stuff out. Because I literally went to bed and just kept thinking about, you know, okay, well, if I play these colors, it can be this. If I do this, I can do this. And, you know, that sometimes happens to me. <laughs> sometimes I get the brewer's fever, as it were. Um, and I basically, like, went to bed at, like, 11, woke up again at 2, kind of fitfully rolled around in bed until like 5 a.m. until eventually I was just like, listen, I'm clearly not sleeping. Um, And then spent hours just on my computer um, and my iPad just typing up deck lists. And I posted literally deck lists for every color combination. Uh, You know, green, red, green, white, green, blue, green, black, uh, all to our team forum this morning um, with sort of a note that was like, hey, if people can help me build these, I want to test these today. Um, we quickly dismissed some of them. The, the, the green-red one had the problems that I was talking about. There's actually that I tested yesterday. Um, and then the green-blue deck just wasn't very good. You know, there, there weren't good blue, cheap interactive cards. There wasn't really any real incentive to be green-blue. Um, and then green-black sort of morphed into a different style of deck, um, you know, that, that Tom Martell was actually uh, testing through much of the day. Um, but green-white was really what I, what I focused on today. And, uh... I really liked it. The, the, the green-white shell offers, in particular, Dromoka's Command, which I think is possibly the most powerful card in the new set. Um, and the thing about Dromoka's Command in this sort of shell is that you have a lot of powerful tools, a lot of ways to use Dromoka's Command. It's really flexible. You know, you can, you can prevent damage with it, you can kill an enchantment, you can, kill, you can fight a creature, you can get plus one plus one. Um, and all of those give you lots of windows to find value for this effect. Uh, in the early turns of the game that you can then return with Den Protector. Um, so this is really the deck that I've been working on. I think it's actually quite good. Um, I tested it you know, against a whole variety of different decks today. Um, struggled a bit with Abzan Control because the card Elspeth is difficult, but I've been sort of taking cards in and out of the deck, um, You know, going from like a sort of more focused aggressive build to a Whisper Word Elemental build to you know build with like uh, Wingmate Rock to get more game against Elspeth. Um, to, you know, trying different spells. I had Valor Stance and wasn't really excited by it. Then I was trying Contestant Tactics. Uh, I'm looking to try God's Willing. Because like I was saying before, the, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of value to just having cheap stuff that you can find uses for. And God's Willing is particularly powerful because, you know, if you just have a few mana up, you know, your opponent does something even God's Willing, you potentially flip, you know, uh, the, the Dead Protection and God's Willing something else even. Um, and that's, you know, that's a pretty powerful effect. And... A lot of the removal spells in this format are, like, relatively expensive. You know, if someone is spending, like, three mana to Heroes Downfall, your guy, and you counter it with God's Willing, um, so, mu- so many games can be decided by that because so many of the games are just who is using their mana more effectively, who is able to do multiple things or stop their opponent's plays, um, you know, do something and stop their opponent's play in a single turn. And that's the reason, like, you know, a card like God's Willing is so powerful, or cards like Dermokov's Man, because you can get multiple effects off of one thing. Um, so, yeah. You have the, and then the, you know, you have the powerful sort of aggressive, aggressive deck backed up by Dromoka's command. Then with the sort of late game grind element of the Raptor and the Den Protector, that can you know get you to uh, you know even beat like really heavy removal draws. I actually beat a draw including multiple Elspeths and an Ugin thanks to Den Protector and uh, uh, Whisperwood Elemental and uh, inter- and Boon Seder on Den Protector. Den Protector's ability, as I mentioned earlier, comes up. Uh, Boon Seder on Den Protector is basically unblockable, and that, that kills an Elspeth. Um, so there's there's lo- lots of little things that you can do to sort of find percentage here and there. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on tuning the list, and so far I've been pretty happy with it. 
um, you know, it has the ability to be uh, to be like aggressive when it needs to be, and can sort of take a controlling route with uh, Dromoka's command and sort of uh, play a longer game thanks to the tools that the sort of Den Protector Raptor engine gives it. So that's where I am right now. Um, I'm also really tired. I might be able to tell because I didn't really sleep last night because um, I was up thinking about Den Protector. <laughs> Uh, I do think that Den Protector and Raptor have been kind of under the radar um, as far as a lot of talk I've seen about Standard right now. So um, I like the fact that, you know, a lot of my opponents won't necessarily be super familiar with the best ways to play against them, won't necessarily know, okay, I played a Morph, okay, there's likely to be Den Protector. Um, I actually had Hidden uh, hidden Dragon Slayer for a bit in my deck, um, in part because I literally forgot Warden of the First Tree existed. And uh, that, that was sort of at the end of the day today. I'd been playing all day, and then it was like, uh, Paul Chion was like, you know, maybe you should try Warden of the First Tree. And I, I literally was just like, that is exactly the card that should be in my deck. And I literally just had it in a deck yesterday and then just forgot it existed today. So that's what, you know, jet lag and no sleep uh, can do to you, I guess. But that's what we're going to start tomorrow, is uh, testing more of this green-white deck with uh, Den Protector. Who is, yeah, protecting my den, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I need some sleep. So... Uh, I'll be back more maybe tomorrow, maybe later, um, but I will definitely keep you clued in and uh, hopefully get some snippets of the actual testing in action uh, that I can share with you. So uh, until then, I'll see ya. So it is, what is it, Tuesday night, I think? Yeah, Tuesday night. <laughs> Lose track of time sometimes. Um, literally, I was just about to get in bed. I'm actually in bed, as you can see right here. Look, I'm in bed. Um, because it's late. It's like past 1 a.m. Uh, I was spending all day testing. It's 1.30, actually, look at the clock. Um, and I'm... <laughs> Tom's like, I don't know, hiding. Look, it's Tom Martel. Do, do, do... Uh, but anyway, <laughs> just like trying to get a cameo here. I was actually just going to show that you're playing on Moto over there. But but anyway, we we, uh, we tested, you know, pretty much all day. And I was playing the green-white deck all day. And it's good. It's not great. Um, I was reasonably happy with how it was performing in a bunch of different matchups. Um, but, you know, it's definitely, definitely a deck that I think that... Uh, I've going, I'm going to feel comfortable playing, which is the biggest part of the reason, you know, a big part of the reason that I'm uh, I'm going to end up playing the tournament. I'm pretty much locked in at this point, um, and uh, you know, tried uh, you know, a bunch of cyborg cards, cyborg games. Uh, I'm going to play more cyborg games tomorrow. Um, you know, made some various random tuning changes to the deck, um, but you know, like the shape it's in. You know, not super thrilled with it, but not you know, not a. Uh, I feel like that has some, some very good matchups. Like I think that against like uh, aggressive red green decks, you're you're a big favorite. Um, I think that against the the sort of bigger red green decks, uh, you might be a little bit of a, an underdog. Um, and then against uh, you know, Abzan Aggro, it feels pretty even. Against like Abzan Control, I think that you're you know a bit of an underdog uh, to just the card Elspeth, but the rest of their deck, your your deck is quite good against. And I think that there's lots of good sideboard options for the deck. So uh, you know. This is sort of where I'm at. It's very strange to be not playing any dragons in Pro Tour Dragons of Tarkir, um, but my deck has none of them. And uh, I was considering playing a single Dramoka in my sideboard just sort of as homage to, uh, to you know, the dragons and whatnot. But, there's, you know, sideboard space is really valuable, and I don't know if I can quite pull that off. We'll see. Um, but yeah, and Tom over here, see so playing Magic Online, uh, he is testing the uh, sort of Abzan version of the 
Raptor Den Protector deck that we put together, um, which you know has been doing doing well, but has not has been sort of struggling against uh, the Dragon decks, uh, specifically uh, Thunderbreak Regent and, and Storm with Dragon. Just the big red and green. yeah, the the big red and green deck in particular has been has been very troublesome for that deck. It was having a lot of trouble winning, um, just because you know it was you know relatively slow and reactive, and a lot of your uh, you know, a lot of your removal spells don't necessarily line up terribly well, and uh, they're able to just pressure you super fast. And sometimes, you know, you you sort of stumble a little bit with with your tap lands and can't kill the things right away. And if they just like you know are on the play with Thunderbolt and a Stormbolt, it's almost impossible for you to win. So, um, yeah, there's that. I, I think that that our team is looks like it's split between half dozen or more different decks, which is kind of a weird position to be in. Uh, I think lots of people are just sort of playing, going to end up playing the decks that they feel most comfortable with. I feel like the the, the metagame is likely to be uh, skewed toward Green Red and Abzan, but otherwise relatively open. You know, like, there's there's a lot of cool stuff going on in the new set, um, and, you know, the format was already pretty open before that. So despite the fact that, you know, the, the uh, Star City Open recently was basically just Red, Green, and Abzan, uh, at least the top tables... Um, I expect to see, you know, some reasonable diversity. So that's part of the reason that I'm, I'm, I'm looking to play the deck that I am is because I think that it's just a, a strong, proactive, consistent deck. Uh, and that, I think, is worth a lot in a, uh, an open, a wide open metagame. So we'll see. Um, so anyway, we're going to be doing some more constructed testing tomorrow, mostly with sideboards and uh, finalizing all that. And then the Pro Tour starts very soon. So anyway, that's why I'm going to go to sleep now because i got to get my rest. So anyway, I will uh, be back with more tomorrow, maybe, maybe later. But anyway, see ya. This is my Pro Tour Dragons of Tarkir deck. Uh, it is the day before the Pro Tour. It's like, uh, what, the afternoon right now. I just went and registered and got the last cards I needed for my deck. And here it is. It's a uh, thing of beauty. <laughs> um, it's my you know green-white aggro deck built around uh, largely the Deathmiss Raptor, Den Protector sort of engine uh, playing uh, Dromoka's Command. This, I think, is one of the more powerful new cards in the new set. Uh, also, Sorak of the Hunt Caller is a big, uh, big uh, component of this deck's power. Previously, uh, decks that were not Abzan, uh, green decks that were not Abzan, didn't have a great four drop. Pulgrims is okay, but not a great aggressive four drop. But uh, Sorak, along with one of the various three power guys you can play early on, uh, can come in and just smash your opponent for five right away, and then allow you to continue to smash as the game goes. Uh, so, another key card here is Boon Sainer. Uh, Boon Seder is great at uh, both allowing your creatures to attack into larger creatures, as well as potentially enabling this guy, Den Protector, to be basically unblockable by making it a huge creature with this, you know, creature with power less than it can't block it. Um, one of the important cards of the deck also is Wingmate Rock. Wingmate Rock uh, allows you to uh, get through Elspeth, which is otherwise potentially a problem. You have a lot of big creatures on the ground. Uh, Den Protector can also get through Elspeth. Uh, but Wingmate Rock is one of the better ways, uh, as a both a three power creature and a flyer can uh, fly over all the little little creatures that are protecting Elspeth. You actually t tend to have issues with Elspeth just plussing rather than the minus ability. And then you know you get the various lands, all very pretty uh, John Avon lands. Um, then Warden of the First Tree here, uh, and the real reason to play this this deck is right here, Elvish Mystic. Elvish Mystic is the best card in standard. 
Uh, it is the best card in most standard formats it's uh, it's legal in. Uh, I have been playing Alana or Elf uh, since, you know, the dawn of time, and, uh, you know, continue to do so while they let me. Um, spells in the deck, other than Drogo's Commands, you got these God's Willing uh, and Valorous Stance. Valorous Stance is kind of a, you know, uh, multi-purpose card that allows you to actually kill your opponent's guys and save your guys, which is something that this deck definitely wants on both halves. Uh, God's Willing is a more efficient uh, version to protect your own guys, uh, that's why we have more of them in the sideboard, which take a look at now. So, uh, we got Hunt the Hunter, which is one of the most efficient removal spells for against other green decks. It's actually not entirely 100% finished. There's one card in debating here, but uh, we got two Glare of Heresy, two Collected Company, uh, two Gods Willing, one Boon Seder, one Master of the Unseen, one Valor Stance, a Plummet, and right here, three Windstorms. Uh, Windstorm, you know, if I'm not going to play Dragons, no one can have Dragons. So that's uh, one of the things that people have asked me at the site. You know, oh, how many dragons in your deck? How many dragons are you playing? I'm like, zero. And you don't get any either. So Windstorm is, like, pretty important um, as a cyber card, not only to kill uh, the various dragons that people are playing, Plummet could do that alone, but uh, also to clear out the insects that come out of a hornet's nest, which is otherwise a, a pretty big problem for this deck because you have a lot of ground attackers. You can get around hornet's nest with Den Protector um, or via uh, Wingmate Rock, but Wingmate Rock is pretty bad against the decks tend to have it, so often that actually gets Sarger out, so you want to have the uh, the Windstorms to clear the way. So uh, I am still debating whether I want a, uh, a a Banishing Light in my sideboard as a possible final uh, final way to deal with uh, Hornet's Nest that can uh, come in elsewhere, but this is what it looks like right now. So, so we'll be taken to battle, and maybe you know, plus or minus one, uh, one Cyber card. I guess not plus or minus, but one, one possible Cyber swap. And uh, yeah, this is what I'm going to win the Pro Tour with. So let's see how it goes. So it is uh, Thursday afternoon for the Pro Tour. I just went and registered for the tournament. Got all my uh, all my stuff set up. Uh, got my deck ready. So I'm, I'm feeling good. Um, I did have a little bit of a crisis of confidence this morning uh, at one point when you know, I was testing my deck and sort of you know, not, not questioning that whether the deck was good, but questioning whether it was the best deck I could be playing. Um, as I mentioned in you know, previous entries, uh, I was experimenting with a, a wide variety of different, uh, you know, aggressive Den Protector Raptor decks, and uh, the green-black version that I made, ultimately, uh, I handed off to Tom Martell, who turned it into more of a sort of Abzan mid-range control style of deck um, that has the, de the, the Den Protector and, uh, and Raptor engine in it, um, which makes that deck a lot stronger against uh, many of the... Uh, other controlling decks in the field because that engine is just very powerful, um, but I, I, I'm not convinced that that's the best way to use it in that shell. I'm not convinced that that, that you know necessarily my deck is the best way to use it. I think that there might be a really good green black aggro deck out there um, that uses the the Raptor Den Protector engine because Den Protector is so good with uh, with like black removal spells, just being able to you know ultimate price and then get the ultimate price back, ultimate price something else. Just super super efficient and uh, and much more flexible than a lot of the the spells that I have in the green white version. Um, I actually at one point this morning had like typed up a possible list of green black and was debating spending time testing it, but I was like the pro tour is tomorrow. I'm not I'm not building a new deck today and uh, you know just sort of jamming it there. I, I I didn't feel like I had the time to sort of refine the list uh, to the point that I was happy with and uh, you know I, I think that my deck is good. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with the, the deck that I am playing, but, uh, you know, I, I, there's still that question mark there of, you know, there's this other deck I could have built, and maybe that deck could have been better. Um, but, you know, that's just sort of how it goes. There's only so much time to prepare for any given tournament, uh, especially Pro Tours, with, you know, the set only coming out, you know, it was only released uh, a week ago, or, you know, a week ago, two weeks ago, whatever it was. Um, so, you know, there's only so much time to have possibly spent on, on developing different things. And then there's just constantly more information coming in. That's one of the, one of the key things um, with testing for the Pro Tour is, you know, you're getting information from things like the Star City Games Open Series. You know, we saw the Invitational results, then we saw the Open Series results where uh, Chris Van Meter won. So, uh, you know, there's, there's just a lot of, a lot of data to be, to be constantly taking in. And your, uh, your ability to sort of filter that data and to analyze that data uh, is really important, and you can't, you know, like, your, your testing at the beginning of, uh, is very different than your testing at the end, because you just have more information at the end. So, you know, knowing, okay, well, if green-red is going to be the most popular deck, what should my deck look like? It, that's, you only start thinking about that, you know, last week, because that was only, the, that was, you know, only when that sort of became, 
you know, sort of what the perspective uh, going into the tournament might be. So if you're like, okay, well, these are the decks I need to beat. Because you know, before that, you might be like, okay, well, we, you know, this format's going to look like it did before, and you know, I'm going to play against like you know Abzan and whatever, and you know, Just Guy, whatever else. Um, but you know, the, the big sort of metagame shifts are really important to pay attention to, and uh, you know, you need to be able to react quickly. And you know, we, we have a, a, a large team. We had I think almost 20 people who were testing with for this tournament, and uh, you know, people are working on various various different things. So you don't necessarily have everyone focused on. Um, you know, exploring all the things that you might possibly explore. Like, I don't think we ever really built a Blue Devotion deck. Um, you know, a lot of people spent a lot of time on, uh, like, Abzan or Jeskai or Esper. Uh, I know that the, the team is pretty split in terms of what they're playing. Uh, there's some people playing Jeskai Tokens. There's a lot of people playing Esper. Um, there's some people who I think might be playing Green White Devotion. Um, I think it's only me and Shuhei playing my deck. It's possible that... Tom or someone else might also audible and play the deck as well, but um, you know, it's nice to have at least at least one other person who uh, <laughs> who believes in my deck. But uh, I was testing, you know, reason why I was Shuhei this morning. We were discussing, you know, sideboard plans and things like that, uh, trying various things in different matchups. Like uh, I was playing against Green Red. Uh, it's actually the Green Red aggressive version, which in game one I think is a very good matchup um, because so many of their cards, like like uh, Rabble Master, are just really bad against you. Um, and after sideboarding, when they turn into like more of a controlling deck where they, they actually have Hornet's Nest, I think that was actually the card that I lost the most, which is a big part of the reason why I'm playing uh, Windstorm in my sideboard. Uh, but yeah, we'll take a look at that in a, in a moment. So anyway, I uh, just wanted to you know get this one last entry in before uh, the tournament starts. So I'm going to take a look at my deck, and, uh, and then we'll get to the actual playing of the tournament. So uh, we'll see. Just finished the first draft here at uh, Pro Tour Dragons of Tarkir, and this is my 3 0 deck. Pretty sweet, bunch of good creatures, bunch of dragons, and uh, yeah, overall pretty happy. Can't really be doing better, so uh, let's keep it up. All right, this is the uh, lunch break after round three, uh, the, the final draft round. I went 3 and 0, so uh, let's just take a look at the you know venue outside. You got this food truck. All these sweet banners and everything, people hanging out, commiserating about their bad records, congratulating each other on their good ones, so that's what the Pro Tour is like. So I uh, just got back from day one of the Pro Tour. Uh, I went 3-0 in the draft, which was, you know, which was nice, and then things kind of fell apart a little bit in the constructed portion. Um, I lost my first round to Esper, um, and I think I made a, a couple of, uh, of, of errors, perhaps, uh, trying to play around cards that didn't end up being in his deck and just sort of slowing myself down to the point that uh, it allowed him to sort of claw back into a game that I might have been able to overrun him. Um, and then uh, then I beat a green-red dragon deck. Uh, amusingly, I actually won a game where my opponent uh, cast a Tarka multiple times, uh, but I just kept plummeting it off of Den Projector. <laughs> uh, that, was pretty, that was pretty sweet. You don't generally beat that card. Not when it resolves. Um, and then I, I lost like a super close match to uh, an Abzan control deck, um, where uh, it was like a pretty complicated situation that uh, that involved like my opponent having multiple uh, indestructible fleeceman lions to my one indestructible fleeceman lion, uh, and then uh, you know an Elspeth and you know, all of my Den protectors and Wingmate rocks were like in the bottom half of my deck in this really long game, and then finally I drew them and started to get back into the game. Uh, and then my opponent drew his his second end hostilities and was able to wipe out my board and uh, and ultimately kill me with his additional indestructible lion. So uh, then I lost to a green white devotion deck where the, the the games weren't weren't super close. Like I I was I was uh, you know I had a shot in each of them, but like uh, didn't have great draws and the windows sort of closed. And then I finally the last round beat a blue black control deck who actually aether spouted me. On multiple occasions, that actually seemed like it might have been a bad matchup, and I managed to squeak by it, so I was happy about that. So, ultimately, you know, starting 3-0 and and ending up 5-3, and I'm not happy with that. 2-3 and in Constructed. I still really like my deck. Um, I feel like, you know, it, it has, uh, you know, a good... Uh, is positioned well in the field that actually ended up showing up. Um, I do think that 
Uh, I like, you know, how aggressive the, you know, I position myself in uh, in a field of a lot of, you know, sort of mid range and, and control decks, um, and I'm, you know, low enough to the ground that I have uh, the tools to beat the like mono red aggro decks that are showing up and things like that. So, uh, you know, would have liked to have gotten at least one more win. There's a big difference, at least in t- terms of how it feels between, you know, six and two and five and three. Uh, six and two, you still have a loss to give for top eight. Five and three, if you lose another one, you're pretty much out of contention. So. Uh, but I don't plan on losing any more tomorrow. We're gonna uh, we're gonna we're gonna see what we can do about that. But uh, now it is time to go off to dinner and uh, rest up and then play day two. So uh, that's what I'm gonna do. I'll be back tomorrow, and uh, yeah, we'll hopefully you know get all these wins and make top eight. So I can wear this. I even brought my here it is. Oh god, my dragon hoodie. I brought this sort of in the tradition of the tiger uh, the tiger hat. You know, in the in the chance that I make top eight, I have this to wear. It's Pro Tour Dragons of Tuck here. It seems appropriate, um, but yeah. Anyway, uh, we'll see if we get the dragon uh, dragon hoodie on stage on Sunday. And uh, now I'm gonna go eat. Bye. All right. Well, here's the second draft deck. Uh, went one and two with this one. Unfortunately, had some weird signals in the draft. And ended up blue black between two blue black drafters. So deck wasn't great. And I uh, was hoping to two and one, but came out with a one two. We'll see if we can salvage this tournament in constructed. So it is Sunday, uh, and the Pro Tour is over. Uh, my Pro Tour, however, ended partway through Saturday. Uh, I actually dropped before the end of the rounds on day two. Uh, I uh, had a rough start in the draft. I went one and two. Um, I had a couple of, of losses there that were uh, were a little a little frustrating. Uh, one of them, uh, frustrating, funny, whichever one. <laughs> one of them, uh, I was really far ahead uh, on board. I won the first game. This is in the first round of draft. And... Uh, I, my opponent had Faux Razor Regent, that was called, whatever it is, um, and I had Encase and Ice on it, and uh, I, you know, had attacked him, you know, with, I was attacking him with Flyers, and uh, he drew Teamer Sabertooth, which not only allowed him to return his Regent and uh, fight something else again, uh, but also made the Crux of Fate in my hand basically worthless. So it was a pretty big swing, and that may have been the single best card in the format that he could have drawn, and... Uh, I managed to lose that one, then lose the next game when I had a pretty poor draw. But uh, I won the next match, then the, the the next draft match, the third draft match, I actually just exchanged mana screw games with my opponent, uh, and then he beat me in the the final game where uh, you know I mulliganed into a weak hand and he had a good hand. So I, I think my draft deck was pretty weak overall. Um, the draft went a little weird for me. Uh, I ended up actually blue-black between two other blue-black players after just not really seeing other colors in the first pack. Um, you know, I actually saw more solid blue and black cards in pack one than really any other color. So uh, the signals sort of threw me off, and I ended up with not a great deck, a little bit of a schizophrenic one. I uh, showed it a little bit earlier. But uh, but then in Constructed, um, I lost to Abzan Aggro in my first match. And the, the, the game, one, uh, game one of that match actually was a little bit frustrating because uh, I actually exactly lost to my opponent top-decking Siege Rhino um, to kill me from... You know, I was at three, he was at one, he was dead in my next turn. Um, and I was actually at three, in part because I took a damage from Mana Confluence um, when my opponent had an Urborg in play, which I didn't know about because it was sort of hidden in his lands. And I actually like noticed it in like a, a later turn and pointed out. I was like, oh, I guess I shouldn't have taken Urborg damage, you know, instead of uh, Mana Confluence damage because you had Urborg. He's like, yeah, I kind of kind of snuck it in there. And uh, you know, well. It's my responsibility to pay attention to the game state. It's not like it was like literally like underneath things. It was kind of clumped in his lands. Um, it's it's that's the sort of card that's like it affects the game in such a way that it feels like you should be you know required to announce it when you actually play it. But I don't know. It is what it is. Uh, that actually mulliganed to four in the next game, so there was you know no justice in the world. <laughs> I actually lost my next match uh, in part because of. Uh, well, in, in in large part because of uh, change that I made to my sideboard. Uh, to, sort of at the last minute. Uh, I was particularly paranoid about losing to the card Hornet's Nest, and I wanted more ways to deal with it. Uh, you know, I had Windstorm on my sideboard to potentially clear them, uh, uh, clear up the bees, but I wanted uh, I wanted more tools, so I swapped out my Glare of Heresies for Banishing Lights. And uh, you know, while that was you know was effective at giving me more, more ways to deal with Hornet's Nest, which by the way I never played against. Um, it made me uh, a little bit more vulnerable in some other matchups in some ways that I didn't really consider because um, I hadn't really I didn't really test the change. I hadn't played a ton of cyborg games uh, in some of the matchups, and I ended up losing because I had Banishing Light instead of Glare of Heresy, and my opponent uh, was able to use Ugin 
to remove my banishing lights and uh, all the rest of my stuff and give him back Elspeth and Siege Rhino at the same time. So, uh, you know, I, I ended up basically losing that, that game. If those had been Glare of Heresies, I almost 100% win that game and that match. Um, so, you know, I, I did, I, there were some people watching uh, the match and, you know, I mentioned, you know, yeah, if I'd played Glare of Heresy, you know, I'd have won. And they were like, you know, I, I kind of stumbled on mana at the beginning of the game, too. I was stalled on two land for a couple of turns. Um, and the game was still quite close. And they're like, well, you were, you know, you were mana screwed. You know, you can't win. That, you know, like, but actually, you know, if I had had Glare of Heresy instead, I think I do win this game. And, you know, I, I think it's more more valuable to be um, sort of self-aware and critical of the decisions that you made rather than the things that are outside of your control. Because, you know, you can't, you can't control whether you get mana screwed. You know, you can control whether you mulligan. You can control, you know how many land you put into your deck, but ultimately, you know, the cards that, you're, that you, you draw from your deck are, are random, well, random of, among the ones you put into your deck, um, and, you know, you, you, but you get to choose those cards you play with, and, you know, you, you need to look at the things that you can control and how you can improve that, and, you know, I definitely could have improved uh, my testing, at least as far as cyber games go, I think that I didn't play enough in some of the other matchups, but frankly, I just didn't have the time, and, you know, I was really, you know, the only person who was, who was working on this particular deck, which meant that, you know, the only, the only games that got played were ones that I was involved in. Um, so it's, you know, it's going to be difficult to get enough, uh, enough sort of data, uh, particularly on cyborg games in that sort of situation. But I, I wasn't, you know, I did poorly enough with the deck that it certainly wasn't a, you know, just a matter of like, you know, oh, a little, a little tweak here, a little tweak there. Um, I think that, you know, there are some fundamental structural issues. I think the core of the deck is very strong. I still like it. Um, I think that it's possible that I uh, sort of missed the boat on trying to be more resilient to Dramoka's command. I should have been, I, I, I like, didn't play or even really seriously test uh, Citadel Siege, which uh, I think would have been a, a serious upgrade in some of the matchups where the deck can struggle. Like, for instance, uh, I was losing Cyborg Games to Abzan Control uh, just against their Fleecemane Lions, uh, making them indestructible. Um, and if I'd had, uh, you know, Citadel Siege instead of just like Surak, for instance, which is a... a a difference that someone had in a similar structure of, of deck to me. Um, you know, I could have just made giant den protectors and be able to, to, you know, win without necessarily having to have, you know, wingmate rock specifically, um, or the combination of den protector and boon Seder. You know, it just gives you more tools in that kind of matchup. And it's also, that, that actually would have been a way to deal with Hornet's Nest, even with the, the cons mode rather than the dragon's mode or vice versa, whichever one it is. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely think that moving forward, um, you know, sort of the takeaway is just I, I hope to be able to, you know, get more time to actually uh, actually test specifically cyborg games um, with with the decks I'm working on. Um, it's it's tough because when I do, you know, I, I tend to be the only person on my team who really does a lot of work on the decks that I do um, that I make. You know, sometimes like last Pro Tour, for instance, uh, I was able to uh, sort of incidentally attract the attention of other people who are interested in similar sorts of decks. Uh, and they ended up, you know, also working on the Wolf Leaf Abzan deck. Uh, that guy, that ended up being very strong. Um, and I think that, you know, with a little bit of help from from uh, other people getting sort of additional ideas and eyeballs on the decks, that that you know, they can get a lot better. And you know, I I, I think I probably should start my testing earlier. Um, this time, you know, I only really started play testing uh, when I got to Belgium, which meant that you know I basically had a week, and you know, I sort of. Uh, changed decks that I was working on, you know, partway through, so, and then had a bunch of different ideas that I was trying out, and, you know, didn't, basically, ultimately didn't have enough time to explore everything that I wanted to. And that's always the sort of the story of, of, of testing for Pro Tours, because they happen so soon after uh, the set releases, but, you know, I think that, that using tools like, uh, uh, like Cockatrice, you know, the sort of online simulators for, for Magic to be able to play against people prior to actually coming to the Pro Tour, I think would definitely help. Um, I feel like overall, you know, I was, I, was, I was happy with how I spent the time that I did have, but I just didn't spend enough of it uh, as far as the actual testing was concerned. Um, I, you know, I, I, was, I was talking to Sam Black for a bit uh, during this tournament and asking him like, how his testing went and, and this and that. And you know, uh, he and Justin Cohen, who uh, made the finals of uh, the last Pro Tour, uh, Fate Reforged, uh, playing the Amulet deck, he was saying that, you know, they just, as soon as the spoiler's out, they just start testing, because uh, they, they're roommates, and, you know, I was saying that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty jealous of just having the opportunity to, you know, have, like, another, you know, sort of serious competitive Magic player who you can, you know, just play with any time. Um, I, you know, I have a lot of, a lot of good friends who, you know, I live near and work with who used to play competitive Magic, but don't really very much anymore, and, uh, you know, my testing for anything, really, is limited to, uh, 
either the sort of in-person testing prior to the Pro Tour or Magic Online. And the, the new sets don't go on Magic Online until, you know, I'm already in whatever location to test for the Pro Tour. So, you know, it, it's, it leaves me with few options. And I, I think I need to try and make better use of the options that are available. Um, and, you know, I, I tested a little bit with Luis um, prior to the Pro Tour Online, uh, again, using Cockatrice. And, you know, it's... A little clunky, particularly given that both of us were sort of getting used to the program because we never really used it before. But I used to do, you know, the majority of my playtesting way back when, um, when I played uh, on the Pro Tour when I was in college. Uh, I did it on Apprentice, which is a very similar program to, to Cockatrice, and that was basically just all the testing I ever did because I was, uh, at the time, you know, I was in school, I was in college, and I only really ever went out to tournaments right before they started. You know, I'd fly to Europe for a tournament on, you know, Thursday, and the tournaments are on Friday. Granted, I never did well in any of the tournaments in Europe because there's no way to recover from jet lag in that time period. Um, but I did, you know, I did well. The, the defense for that wasn't an issue. Uh, and, you know, the online testing does work out if, if you have the, you know, an, uh, enough people who are taking it seriously. I mean, like, that's how uh, the, you know, now Team Ultra Pro did a lot of their testing. So, but anyway, yeah, it's sort of, I, I definitely want to come out of this with not just like, you know, oh, I got unlucky, yada, yada, yada. But in some cases, yeah, that's a little bit of what happened. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, there's some definitely could be improvements to the testing process that um, that we, or at least I personally, used for this event. Because a lot of people came out before I did. Um, a significant portion of the team was actually here a full week before I was. But, I mean, that's just not a realistic thing for me. So uh, I think I need to just find ways that I can uh, put more time in to actually get decks to the point that I'm happy with um, and that they, you know, that they need to get to uh, in order to legitimately be uh, competitive at the highest level. Because, you know, for this event and for, I guess, the last couple of events, the last event, I think your deck was very good. Uh, Hawaii, you know, I basically didn't test because I uh, was on a cruise with Natalie. <laughs> um, but for this one, you know, I feel like I, just a, a bit more testing, I would have come up with... Uh, you know, with some better ideas and had better uh, better notion of how things played out in certain matchups, particularly after sideboarding, that would put me in a better position to succeed. So, uh, anyway, only one Pro Tour left this year. I actually was funny. I was I was talking to someone. They were like, "Oh, I need you know this many more points to get to gold." And I was like, "Oh, well, there's two more Pro Tours." So like, no, there's only one one more Pro Tour. And I was like, "Oh yeah, I basically just forgot that Hawaii happened because I barely consider myself as having played in it." <laughs> but uh, but anyway. Uh, but yeah, one more Pro Tour. You know, I don't really have very many points. Um, thankfully, I don't have to worry about qualifying again because I am in the Hall of Fame, but I certainly would like to do well at one of them. I, I did pretty well at the last event, like 60th place, which is, you know, reasonable, but uh, certainly one another top eight, and uh, we'll see if we can do that next time. So anyway, um, that is going to be it for this sort of set of video logs. Uh, if you do have any questions or comments, uh, let me know, and uh, I'll see what I can do next time. So thanks for watching, and I will see you later.